to. We've been talking roadside service today. And I'll say one thing. If you're on a road trip today and you're not quite sure if you have roadside service, you got plenty of time to kill cruising down the road, have your passenger make the phone call, grab your insurance card, call your insurance company and say, hey, do I have roadside service? And you probably do and you don't even know it. Or if not, how much is it? You'd be surprised how much money you can save having that through your insurance company as opposed to some independent membership. So you're saying you might start with your insurance company. Give them a call first if you're thinking about buying it. So when, when we're done with the show, you're going to go call your insurance company and say how much yeah, before it, you go sign up for $55, but, $100 a year. But the beauty with the insurance company, you can say turn it on. And then you can say turn it off. But it's only a buck or two bucks a month. so It's a no-brainer. So even, even if that's the first phone call just to say turn it on. I don't have anything. Anything's better than nothing. Start there. So Well, up for this segment, we've got an ever-patient Matt with a 2001 Ford or Lincoln Navigator. Go ahead, Matt. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. I've got a, an older model Lincoln Navigator that uh, is a third car we just brought down from uh, Utah. And I want to just sell it, but I have got a couple of problems. Uh, do I need to register it in Arizona before I sell it? And then also... It's got a cracked windshield, um, so can I sell it with the cracked windshield, or do I need to replace that before I either sell it or register it? Well, no, there's no law that requires you to do that, although, you know, in Arizona does not have a stringent inspection process where you have to go through a state safety inspection like they might have in Virginia or Pennsylvania. I think Texas has one. But when you do register a car in the state for the first time, there's some basic stuff that you need to go to DMV and get inspected. It might help you sell it a little bit easier. As a One of, less hurdle for whoever buys it to get through. Yeah, and, and it, you know, you could leave a cracked windshield. That's a negotiating tool. You might have glass coverage on your on your insurance and, and get it for free. Um, so the other thing that I would maybe consider doing, as long as the check engine light is off, it should go through the emissions test no problem. And to just make it that much easier, if you don't register it in Arizona, go find an admission station. It's servicearizona.com. You can go find an admission station close to your house. They have a pretty cool system where there's cameras, so you can actually see how long the line is, and they'll tell you what the weight is. Go get an admissions test, because that's what a lot of people are leery of, is, right. is whether the car is going to pass emissions or not. And that will just help you. But to title so, it, you don't necessarily need to pass emissions. That's if to register, I mean, for your registration or your tags... You'd have to pass emissions. I'd go get the emissions test and maybe not worry about the title, although I did. I have a brother that lives in Utah, and I helped him sell a Mercedes. We sold it down here. And the guy said, well, I have to get it. It has to be Arizona registered before my credit union will will fund. That didn't make sense to me. But, but in most cases, I don't think you're going to have a problem. Well, thanks for the call, Matt. Let's go with Art in Mesa on a 1992 Olds 98. Is that a 98 or a 92? Like 92, 98. 92, Olds 98. Go ahead, Art. You're on Bumper uh, to yes. Bumper Radio. Uh, I have a question. Uh, had the oil changed in that car to, uh, a week or so ago, and then I find out that he put five quarts of oil in it, and I've been putting four and a half quarts in it for 15 years, well, and it, of course, shows way over full. Uh, is that going to harm this car if I drive it for another 1,000 miles before I change it? Chances are it won't harm anything, but it can be harmful over the long run to have uh-huh. to have too much oil in the car. Yeah. So you've actually pulled the dipstick and checked the oil, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, I would make a suggestion, and that would be to take it back to the shop that did the oil change and tell them that you want your oil level adjusted to the appropriate level. That That's what I would do because over time, the oil, the high oil level, there's ash in the oil that can harm catalytic converters. It can do a lot of damage, but on the short term, it's not going to do anything, but it's not a good idea either. Yeah, not necessarily damage, so you don't have to worry about that. 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You know, Dave, the, just talking about the, the prior gentleman that called with the Navigator for sale, this weekend is a big weekend for two things, moving, I think it's U-Haul's busiest weekend of the year. Moving and car buying. There's a lot going on. The new models are coming out. The 13s are going to be hitting pretty soon. So there's a lot of action in new and used cars. I cannot express to you how important it is that you have got to go get any used car you buy checked out from an independent party before you buy it. We had another disaster in the shop this weekend. The guy bought the car for a used car lot in Mesa a week ago. They had the check engine light circuit cut. Their car had 
14 different safety related codes in it, ABS problems. I mean, wires tucked and hidden. It was a disaster. You've don't, got to protect yourself. Don't buy a used car sight on scene. And if you're buying a new car because you can afford one, get ready to uh, defend yourself in the finance office. Uh, you know, one of the things they're going to offer you in the finance office is an extended warranty. Do you buy one? Don't you buy one? There's a lot of different theory as far as is it good for you. Uh, in some cases, there is good extended warranty companies. More than not, I don't favor them because they're so cumbersome to work with and they tie up the customer for a lot longer than it needs to be. Yeah, there, there's some good ones and it's insurance though. They're making money or they wouldn't be doing it. Just be careful. And the other thing I will remind you too, with 90% of those warranties, those aftermarket warranties that you can buy, you can buy it for the same price or less later on because you got to remember that warranty doesn't kick in for three years or thirty six thousand miles. Right. So, so as long as you buy it before the third year, the thirty six thousand, you can you can pick those up cheap. Well, let's go with Jr. in Mesa on a nineteen ninety nine Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Jr. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey guys, uh, happy Saturday to you. Thank you. Um, I was uh, this is this is my mother's vehicle, and I've been working with her. Um, she didn't have very much success. Uh, with the local shop, um, and that might be a, a second question for you guys a little later. But uh, it's 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 pulling a code saying uh, there's no activity with one of the O2 sensors. So what we've done so far is we've replaced the O2 sensor. Um, we've swapped the O2 sensors to make sure that it doesn't then to, to make sure the O2 sensors functioning correctly and it doesn't pull the code for the other side. Do you know what the code was? Because there is no code that says there's no activity from the oxygen sensor. Do you, I, do you remember I, the number I, by chance? I honestly don't okay. remember. Okay, go ahead. Um, the, 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 the fixes for it that it had listed was uh, O2 sensor was faulty, uh, the uh, pigtail was faulty, or the uh, computer was faulty. So we did replace the O2 sensor. We ended up replacing the computer, and it still populates that code. So we're wondering if it's somewhere, if it's got to be in the wiring harness somewhere. Well, probably not in the wiring harness. And, and really what we need to know, and what you don't have, unfortunately, is what the real code is. Because like I said, there's no code that says the oxygen, there's no activity, you know, verbatim. But it's clearly not the computer, and it's clearly not the oxygen sensor. Depending on which engine that has in it, if that has the 5.3 liter engine, that's very common for those to have a vacuum leak from the intake manifold gaskets, and that causes a lean condition in a check engine light. And that's uh, a that's a good point because every time someone does go to the little uh, Acme Auto Parts and they scan it, it's always going to say three things. It's going to say the O2 sensor, the wiring or the computer. Yeah, and, and JR, you had to, I'm sorry to cut you off, Dave. I cut JR for a little bit early. He did have two questions, and I think I know what the second question might have been, but JR, are you still there? I'm still here, yeah. Well, my, my second question is, uh, my, my mother had taken this vehicle into a shop. Uh, the code came back on after they said they fixed it, so she brought it back in, and then they, they claimed they fixed it a second time and gave her a guarantee that that check engine light wouldn't come on. Well, turns out they unplugged the bulb from the check engine light. No way. And I was wondering, is is that something I should report to somebody? Because that just doesn't seem legal or ethical at all. Absolutely. The, it, Attorney General. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I w at first I was going to say, yeah, you know, as much as you may not want to, you need to go back to the other shop and give them a chance. But for them to do that, that is a flat-out scam. So, so two things you need to do. You, you should make a complaint with the Better Business Bureau, but you need to do that after, after you've gone and got it fixed. And you're in Mesa. We've got a couple great shops in Mesa. If you go to bumpertobumperradio.com, there's a map there and there's 30 some odd shops listed. They are all good people. They know right from wrong. They know how to do to fix cars. Get your car fixed first. Then once that's done, make your complaint, be nice, be brief, stif stick with the facts. It's time for Fact or Fiction. Man, i got to cut this guy off. He's so long-winded. I've been waiting to push that button hey, for I get five minutes. I get cranked up when people do stuff like that, I pull a light. That's just be loney. That Same is Same thing horrible, that happened man. on this used car deal the other day that we saw. It, it's, it's disgusting. 
Just me, I'm getting fired up, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> His forehead is red and he has no hair. So, anyway, the uh, fact or fiction for today, since we're talking roadside in the uh, is aerosol type tire inflators a good roadside fix? He looks so confused. If you guys could see him now, he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> I'm gonna slap you one of these days. I always got to get a bald joke in. And what? And it's not only an inflator, but it's the sealer you're talking about, right? Dave? Yeah, the f- inflator sealer fix. Fix a flat, I think, was one of the brands back in the day. And you keep some in your, you know, it could get you out of a jam. It really could. This is a double, I mean, two answers. It's it's, Okay, be quick. We got to go to break. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) We decide when we go to break. (laughs) So you can, you you said back in the day. Well, back in the day, if you have a back in the day car, pre-2007, it's probably a good idea for you. Or it's a good way to get you out of a jam. If you have a late model car, 07 and newer, with, a tire pressure monitoring system. Oh, absolutely wreck it. You can destroy those sensors. Now, I've seen some at SEMA last year. I did see some inflators. Some of the new cars don't even come with a spare tire. They've got a special slime like we use on our bicycle tires. Um, They've got a special slime type additive that is okay for those sensors and won't ruin the sensors. So be careful on what you use. You don't want to take a tire repair issue and turn it into a $50 or $60 uh, sensor replacement. Well, we got some calls to squeeze in here quickly. Let's go with Mike in Casa Grande on a 1998 GMC Jimmy. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a 98 Jimmy. I uh, just had a fuel pump put in, and it, it's not it's not engaging the fuel pump when I turn power on to the, to the key. Why was the fuel the pump... Ignition, rep- switch, the ignition switch problem? No, well, that's, you're starting at the furthest point away. Why was the fuel pump replaced? Because you thought that was the problem? or, or I mean, what's Well, that was the diagnosis when I took it in. They, they, they said that that's what was wrong. And, and then you came back and replaced the fuel pump, or somebody else did? or No, they did. They did. And then the car never left the shop? Yeah, they left the shop, but, you know, they told me it was taking a couple of cranks for it to start. And before, before I, I took it in, I would just put power, you know, to I wouldn't crank it. And I would just put power, and I could hear the, the fuel pump come yeah, on. Yeah, that going. initial that initial little burst. It, it would whir, and when I turned the key off, I could hear the power pump turn off. I guess it would whir again to turn down or whatever. Well, it down. Hey, Mike, you're not hearing that noise now. Is that why the question? Yeah, that's, that's, I, it's cranking great. You know, it's cranking, but I'm not hearing the whirring of the fuel pump. Well, that's probably because it's got a new pump, so I'm not quite sure if you really have a problem or not. When those pumps get old, they get noisy, and when they're fresh and new, it's going to sound totally different. Let's go with Rob in Tempe on a Silverado. Go ahead, Rob. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hello? Go for it, Rob. You're up. That's a uh, V6, uh, 96 Chevy Silverado, and uh, what it's doing is it's like cranking over three or four times before it'll start. And uh, it's been doing it for like a year now. I can't seem to solve it. I put new plugs, new wires, rotor cap. I took it into a shop uh, a while back, and there was a code, and it solved the code. They put a new new fuel pressure regulator on it. And I got it home, and the code's gone and all, but it just seems to crank over three or four times uh, before it starts. Longer than it used to? You much, yes. I would say this because just like the last phone call, when you initially turn the key, you get that, that fuel pump will run and, you know, and bring up the yes. pressure. Maybe cycle the key twice, maybe three times before you actually bump the starter and then see if it fires up real quick. If it fires up real quick, we may be starting to have a, a weak fuel pump. Yeah, and that'll be a good tip for the shop to, to help them kind of drill back down and narrow what it was. And what happened probably on the fuel pressure regulator, when the pressure regulator went, goes bad, they rupture. There's a rubber diaphragm. They rupture, and and that allows – there's a vacuum line on the other side of the diagram, diaphragm that helps control pressure. So what happens when those break, the engine's just sucking raw fuel in. So that's that was the reason I'm sure they fixed the pressure regulator. Well, you want to squeeze in one more, Matt? Go for it. You pick them, Dave. Tim Cassegrand, 2012 Ford. I'm curious. Go ahead, Tim. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, I just purchased, like I said, that 2012. It's got the new diesel motor in it. Ooh. When I got it, they offered um, the extended warranty. I wanted to know your opinion of these extended warranties. They said this warranty, they kind of tailor it to my driving habits. I don't put a whole lot of miles on it, so they said it would cover it for eight years and 60,000 miles. And you already purchased um, it? 
Yeah, I purchased the truck. I have not purchased the warranty. They said I can come back and make that decision in a few days if I want to. Yeah, you can make that decision all the way up to three years or 36,000 miles. Right, there's no sense um, in buying it until the factory warranty is up. So maybe toward the end of the factory warranty. Go well, and it. that diesel motor has probably a 100,000 or a 50,000 mile warranty on a lot of those components. So I think you take your time, you do your research, you're not... You don't need to buy that right now, and why finance it for three years before you can even use it? So yeah, well, they say what it does is extends the 336 warranty, basically the bumper bumper part of it. Yeah, they told me the motor has a hundred thousand on it. Yeah, but my point is, you don't get to the 330. You don't even get to use it for the first time for another three years or thirty six thousand miles. So well, <laughs> and on those new Fords too, Tim, they um, you do need to be careful with what oil you use in there. Uh, there is a special. Spe- you know, we call it special, but it's special for your diesel truck. Ford wants a very specific oil in there, and uh, make sure you stick stick close to that that schedule and the oil requirements. Well, we are glad you spent your Labor Day Saturday with us to start a relationship with a great shop. Bumper to BumperRadio.com. Thanks, Peter, for putting on a great show. Remember to get those kids in a booster seat. I'm breaking the law here today because my child's <laughs> 70. He's right on the cusp. He's Matt Allen, and I am Dave Riccio. Remember not to text and drive and wear those seatbelts. Have a great weekend.